Oh, yeah. Oh, my voice is back. Yes. <laughs> Hi. I'm Yvonne Irvin. I'm the Director of Development for the Confluence Center for Creative Inquiry. And I'd like to thank you all for coming to our second gala. And um, it's really great to see all my good friends here. And uh, I'd like to thank the Hacienda del Sol for doing a really fabulous job and working with us and putting together a great evening for you all. And uh, I wanted to make sure that uh, I have these goodie bags on everybody's, on everybody's chair, and there's lots of goodies in it, uh, including um, a save the date for our Graduate Fellows Colloquium, which will be on April the 3rd. And so please save that date, and it's sponsored by uh, Bill Westcott and Associates, Associates being Camille Coyle and Joanna Westcott. And we thank them very much for that great support of our Graduate Fellows. And uh, Javier will introduce the graduate fellows in a, in a moment. I'd like to thank our, uh, our staff that is here. We have uh, Heather Gray, who is our new community engagement person Hi. over there. Hello. And Alice Richerly, who is our uh, grants person. Yes. And I would like to thank uh, Dopey Hillenbrand and The Shanty for sponsoring our graduate fellows. Shanty. The Shanty, yes. yes. <laughs> when you patronize something a long time, you get some money. Right. <laughs> and, um, and also, if you, and I know you will enjoy this program, we have a, a brochure in the, in the goodie bags about creative collaborations which is a series that Paula is doing, which John and I were talking about, which should be, just be called Paula Fan and Friends. Yeah. And there are yeah. three more of them. They're on Saturday mornings at 11 at the uh, Student Union Bookstore. And the next one will be about African American or Black, Black History Month. And uh, it'll be a, a fabulous thing. And Paula is also, this is kind of, kind of segueing into the Desert Song Festival, and Paula will be doing a thing, I think, called Paula Fan and Friends next Thursday at uh, Crowder Hall. It's, it's free and, and we are one of the sponsors. And the one last thing I'd like to talk about is our biggest uh, endeavor to date, and we are going to have a venue at the Festival of Books. It's called Voices Across Borders, and we're bringing in some very fine <coughs> Latina writers, and uh, we are going to have it at the Stevie Eller Dance Theater, beautiful space, and we're looking for more sponsors. So if you have anybody who might be a sponsor, let me know. I have some packages here, sponsor packages. I'd like to thank Phil Ferranti from El Cisne. He is one of our sponsors. And uh, I think that is it. Do I have any more? That's it. And so without further ado, you're going to be a sponsor? Oh, that's, I'm sorry. No, you are a sponsor too. I'm sorry, I'm a bad person. Blue <laughs> Agave Bed and Breakfast is a sponsor as well. Yay! Yay! Yay. Yay. And you will see there will be a, a, a flyer on Blue Agave and uh, El Cisne in the goodie bag. So thank you. And now I would like to introduce the director of the Confluence Center for Creative Inquiry, Dr. Javier Duran. Thank you all for being here. This is a tremendous success and it's so delightful to see so many faces that we've seen at different events finally come together and meet each other and recognize what we do. Um, no long speeches, you know, you guys know what we're doing and we're doing good work and we thank you for your support. We hope to see your events and to follow us. Uh, but I want to uh, acknowledge uh, some people here. And I want, I want to acknowledge our board members that came tonight, uh, Professor Ann Betterish, uh, Professor Allison Deming, and Professor Tom Sheridan. Could you please just stand up so everybody knows? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We appreciate your support and um, your great ideas for, to make conference better. I also want to acknowledge our Vice Provost for Academic Affairs, Gail Burr, who is here. And uh, let me uh, now um, introduce our grad fellows, uh, Kevin Shaw from Music. Okay. Kevin is working on development of real-time art and music visualization programs, and he's doing excellent work, and we're happy that you're here with us tonight. Uh, we also have Diane Daly from Library Sciences. Diane is working 
working on advancing the field of Mexican puppetry research. And I'm sure you can ask her more about her research as the evening continues. Thank you for being here. Uh, and then we have Diana, uh, Diana Montaño from the Department of History. And Diana is examining the way culture influenced the electrification of Mexico in the 20th century. So it's an exciting project. And we also have Lucero Radonic from Anthropology. And Lucero is working on creating a bilingual website explaining informal water infrastructure in the state of Sonora, Mexico. Cool. All right, it's an exciting project. Uh, our Vice President of Research, Jennifer Barton, should be here later. Uh, and so I hope that she can um, address um, some of you uh, when she arrives. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the main event tonight, our distinguished colleagues that have agreed to uh, bring their talents together and really, really create a dialogue between art, science, and the human condition. And it's an honor for me to welcome them. And I will start with uh, Regis Professor Paula Fan, uh, professor of piano at the U of A, where she specializes in collaborative piano study. She has performed as soloist and chamber musician on five continents. She made her London debut in 1977 and her New York debut in 1978. She told me not to say that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> been around for a while. Yeah. In 1980, she joined members of Beijing Central Philharmonic Orchestra for the first concert of Western chamber music since the Cultural Revolution. In 1981, the first ever accompanist coach invited by the Chinese minister of culture, she organized and accompanied the first little brand to be presented in many years. Dr. Fan has recorded 15 albums and has broadcast for the BBC, National Public Radio, Radio, Radio Television China, and other international stations. She has coached and accompanied singers from the world's leading opera houses, and as a specialist in wind chamber music, she has performed with many of today's leading uh, clarinetists at numerous international festivals. Dr. Fan is also a pianist with the Tucson Symphony Orchestra, and she is the mastermind uh, behind our creative collaboration series. Thank you, Paula, for pushing us in the And our second uh, colleague, guest, uh, performer tonight is Dr. John Hildebrand. He's a UVA, uh, he's a British professor of neurobiology and founding head of the Department of Neurobiology here at the UVA. He's known for his work on the neurobiology and development of insect olfactory systems and their effects on insect behavior. He pioneered the use of the hog moth Manduca sexta, the, the tobacco hornworm moth, as a model organism for studying the organization of insect sense of smell. By increasing the understanding of how insects behave and function, Dr. Hildebrand's work can also help combat insects that are vectors of disease or predators on crops. He holds joint appointments in biochemistry and molecular biophysics, entomology, and molecular and cellular biology at the University of Arizona. He has received many, many international awards as of uh, recent times, and um, also an honorary degree from the Università degli Studi di Cagliari in Italia. Uh, recent awards uh, include the Fellow International Society of Neuroethology, the Royal Ent Entomological Society of London, and the honorary professorship at Wonsu Medical College in Wonsu, Xinjiang, in China. So with that, I would like to welcome you, and uh, thank you again for doing this, and Paula, you... We're on. Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm gonna flip a coin to see who starts. I'm very honored to be joined by John Hildebrand, who in some ways has been my mentor. And we've been on many committees together, uh, mostly as a result of the fact that he drafted me. I did oh. not ask. But we realized that we had quite a lot in common because he has another life that was not uh, introduced by Dr. Duran. And this is sort of a true confession at this particular point. But it is on this life that we figured that we had an awful lot in common. Uh, so, tell me about yourself. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I thought you might ask. <laughs> Let me start, though, by saying what a pleasure it is to be here, and especially to do this little gig with my dear friend Paula. There's nobody I admire in our university more than this wonderful person. So, 
This is the first time we've ever done something in public together. We're not sure how it's going to work. But if it goes okay, we were thinking we might take it on the road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. In a big bus, you know, patient. <laughs> so I think what Paula wanted me to tell you is that uh, from the age of four until I went to college, I had a monomaniacal fascination on being a musician. I wanted to be a musician more than I wanted to do anything else. And I went to college expecting to be a music major. In fact, I said when I got there, that's what I was going to do. Uh, but I, and I had started working as a professional musician when I was 15 years old. But I took a general education science course the first semester in college, and it presented me with a predicament. I came to a fork in the road. And those of you who follow the greatest philosopher of the 20th century, Yogi Berra, <laughs> you know that Yogi told us that when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Take it. <laughs> so I, I took it, and I kept working as a musician, as a freelance musician, uh, for a total of 30 years while developing a career as a scientist. And there are a lot of funny stories that go with that. Uh, no time to tell them here, but uh, it was a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde life. Maybe later if there's time, if you ask me, I'll tell you some stories. Have a drink, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but I think the reason I have the privilege of sitting up here and, and, and carrying on one of our wonderful conversations, but in public, uh, is that yeah, I had a long life as a musician, but now I'm a neuroscientist. So I, I, I have two perspectives on this wonderful art form. Uh, or an art in general. That is the beauty and importance of art for the human condition, but at the same time, what's going on in your head uh, with, when you appreciate and, and engage in uh, uh, an art like music? So I think that's why we're together tonight. But the truth is that we like to have these conversations anyway, and we're gonna try to just do that in public. Now let me invite all of you to speak up if you want. You know, we don't have a script, so we would love to have you challenge something that I am particularly saying because Paul is always right. Uh, or, nice or, or volunteer something. Just let's make this a dialogue in the spirit of the Confluence Center if, if you wish to engage. I won't call on anybody. But <laughs> I'm sort of curious, how many of you out there are in the sciences nominally? Just hands, okay? How about humanities? Uh, social sciences, all that good stuff. How many of you are musicians? There's a few, more than a few of you out there. Yeah, uh-huh. This is and, great. And we're all together. Uh, just a little word about my background. I'm sort of him in inverse, uh, because I grew up a around the sciences. Actually, there are more than a few of you out there may remember my father, who was a professor of physics. And um, my parents had no musical background whatsoever. My mother was a theoretical mathematician. My playground was on a cyclotron. I, I, uh, I, mean, I, I grew up in Midway Labs. That's where I played. And I also was known to have opened a small box that had a lavender and egg yolk colored insignia. And it was, of course, a radioactive source. And so right. I have an excuse for being just a little bit different. Uh, and, and I was surrounded by scientists. Um, uh, 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 Gerard Kuiper's wife was the one who chewed out my father for leaving me alone as a baby. But he said, if you put on a record or a stack of records, she'll just be quiet. Uh, and, and the other thing is that I still have uh, Chandra Sikhar's dinette set. That was the first part. That was my first piece of furniture when I left home. So, uh, and my parents were not your usual tiger parents. They were very good about me trying just about anything. And my dad, in particular, said, do what makes you happy. And I was going to be a mathematics teacher, but I played the piano, and I liked it, and it wasn't that hard. And uh, I was always, shall we say, one to take the path of least resistance, and so here I am. I had a lovely piano teacher when I moved to Tucson who said, won't you try music? And for a semester, it's been a very long semester. <laughs> so we are we are sort of mirror, in, you know, funhouse mirrors uh, images of each other. I have to say that when Paul and I get together, which I like to do as often as we can, uh, we love to tell stories about our experiences in the business. Uh, it's great fun for me. It's a, I stopped doing it actively in 1985, but but I, I, I have vivid memories, and I always 
can resurrect those and, and, and share experiences with Paula. And, you know, it's amazing how similar our experiences have been uh, with all the personalities and the quirks of the business. Yes? Um, I, come, I come from the science side, so I'm not really big on the humanity side, but I do have a little bit of which kind of gives me the low, low compliance side of music. But my sense of, of, of mathematics and music has always been they kind of live in the same zone together. Uh, you know, if you, talk, if you go to the, what music is about and how it's presented and, and, and it's recorded and, and, you, and you actually, you know, play it in your mind, there's a lot of mathematical aspects about it. Do you guys find that in your, in your well, This life? is a great prompt to give you. Yes, I'll say. Because, like, because we, were, we were charged with, maybe they paid you to say it. No, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can't afford to pay me. Yeah, yeah. I understand. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the reasons we, we were we're here is because I represent neuroscience, the science of studying the brain and what it does, and Paula represents brilliantly the, the wonderful performing art of music. And we both have interest in science and music, but we, we have these different perspectives. And what I wanted to say very briefly, uh, and not in technical language, is that the field of neuroscience, the study of the, the nervous system, particularly the brain, that's a field that started in about 1970, hmm. amazingly. And today, there, are, there have been over 100,000 members of the Professional Society of, of Neuroscience. This is a field that came out of nowhere and suddenly has become such a thriving, big business that it's hard to reckon that rate of growth. And why is that? It's because what goes on in the brain is somehow what we are. I tell my students when I walk around classroom with a brain in my hand, that everything that person <laughs> thought, did, felt, it's right there. But whether it was Mother Teresa or Hitler. And uh, that goes for our appreciation of, of beautiful things, as well as our repulsion from ugly things. It's all there. Now, I don't want to sound like a, some kind of absurd reductionist who doesn't give any credit for feelings, but what I submit to you is that as important as feelings are and, and appreciation of all the different parameters of, of music or any other art, it somehow has to be explained by that thing. It isn't your liver or your skin that's doing it. Uh, but now to your point, uh, in, in the development of the field of neuroscience, it started out, and I've been there since this, before it started, uh, it started out with very reductionist biological questions about the, the, the actual mechanisms of how nerve cells work and so forth, and that's still a big part of it. But today, there. <clears throat> There are many subfields, neuroeconomics, neural law, neuroethics, and neuromusic. Mm -hmm. People now are being professionally attracted and very serious about trying to understand how the brain subserves our appreciation of, of ethical issues, how, how decisions are made, and also, what is it about music? Music especially seems to get right into the core of your brain without you even knowing it. Now, part of it, I think, is what you mentioned. There's something about the organization of sound in time, which, after all, is a, is a mathematical kind of a thing, if you look at it the right way, that we all resonate to. It's not the only parameter of music that seems to get right into the core of one's brain. And I hope I'll have moments to say more about that. But, but this thing about patterns in time, I think, is very much at the heart of it. And you said something very true. I could give many examples. Musicians who are also scientists and scientists who are also musicians, and I'm including mathematicians among scientists. This is a very common observation. Let me give you one anecdote very quickly, and then I'm going to hand the baton back. When I was working as a musician in Boston, I, was, I always did it at night, but I was doing my other job in the daytime. I used to freelance with a horn player who was a professor at MIT a physics professor, very good horn player. So we were kind of similar, we were freelancing in the night. Well, the Boston Symphony had an opening for principal horn. And that was after the days when they introduced a screen. So the auditions are done blind behind the screen. You don't know who's auditioning. They played all the auditions and they took the screen down and the person who won the audition was a physics professor at MIT. Wow. Now, I have many other examples like that, but that one really got me because he had never played fully full-time professionally. He had not studied in a conservatory. Mm -hmm. I can identify with him, but he was much better than I did. But, but 
it was amazing to realize the intimate linkage in a person like Charles Kowalowski, that individual, between what he did as a professional scientist and what he did as a musician, so that he could flip back and forth with that kind of ease. Back to you, dear. Back to me. You know, your observation about music and mathematics has been made to me a lot. Uh, of course, I was freshman advisor for a long time. And within the School of Music, uh, it's a very, very different culture should you choose to wander over there. And uh, I had more freshmen saying, well, what am I going to do for my math requirement? I don't know what to do. And we tend to come, I mean, our students tend to come from the other end. And traditionally, and this is changing now, but over the course of the last uh, 30, 40 years, you would have an awful lot of people coming in purely for the love of it and they had never bothered to take things apart. Uh, actually, in the uh, British system, it is quite possible, first of all, in the British system, you don't find the conservatories submitted <coughs> to the universities that you, the way you do here. This is changing, of course. So my stepson, who was a wonderful violinist, managed to get into the Royal College of Music and get through without taking one academic subject, and that includes an academic understanding of music. Mm -hmm. And he was a wonderful, wonderful violinist. And he had what people would say, that gift. And we sort of wonder where that came from. And um, there is, I think, a sort of romanticized idea of the artist, where it comes from inside. And it is, we are, we are born to be this way. It is our fate. Uh, we, it, passion, you know, rather than precision. And um, however, people are beginning to change. But still, amongst my cohort, there is, I must say, a, 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 a certain amount of science phobia. Science phobia, math phobia, uh, that is born from this particular stereotype. Mm -hmm. And I remember having a number of freshmen coming in and worrying, since they were being put through a, a very structured way of training from a certain professor, that they would lose their, well, not their humanity, but their musicianship. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. so, so you, you find coming from the other end, you know, this idea to hold on to what we musicians feel, we artists feel, is this gift that we have. However, when you start talking to the real pros out there, just some of them, not all of them, you will find that there are plenty of nights when you're on tour that you don't want to be there. You want to be at home with your significant other or your cat or something with a glass of wine uh, doing anything than playing a concert. But as a performing artist, we have the uh, responsibility to give that person who has bought that ticket the best that we can possibly do. And if you don't know how you do it, the person is out of luck. If they're waiting for that night when it's all together, they're out of luck. And so more and more uh, people are beginning to think about what you do to get a certain effect. And it sounds very callous to say, so, uh, sometimes I go out with the idea, I think I'm going to play with the audience tonight. Not play for the audience, that's part of it. But I think I want to play with them. I want to see if I can get them to feel a certain way. And um, it makes me sound like a, a sort of evil, mad <laughs> Svengali or something like that. But there is a certain joy in this, and it does really hone the intellectual part of approaching music. And there is plenty of intellect involved in it. Just in the same way that my father was taking things apart in his brain, we too do the same thing. I want to come back to the brain for a minute because I think that's why I'm sitting here. I'm supposed to do that. But it's pretty interesting to me. I'm not an authority in that area, but, but it's on my bucket list to become one. Uh, because now there's a big sub-discipline of, of neural music, and there are books and major research initiatives to try to understand the brain basis of music. or In other words, what's going on 
with music, both in, in the creation of music, but also especially for all of us, what's interesting is our appreciation of music. And this is one of the things we agreed that we would probably bring up and talk about a bit. But before we get to talking about that, as we had thought about doing, I want to just mention, because I'm a biologist, that there's nothing new with humans. There's a tendency for people uh, to think that, you know, there's a lot that's very special about humans and, you know, we don't share these wonderful attributes with animals. That is really wrong. Uh, I, I will just cite one or two examples. Those of you who know anything about whales may know that whales sing and they actually create new songs. So there are some species that create a new individual specific song each year. And there's, there's, it's not only something by which they're recognized by their fellow whales, but it's an expression, it's thought, about so, uh, somehow of how that whale is feeling or its experience. That's, that's creating music. And that's not a human. That's not a primate. Uh, admittedly, it's a very highly evolved and intelligent animal. But we can go even to the creatures I work with. There, there are whole books written about the music created by insects. These are fabulous stories about the dialects of songs that, that insects can produce that are not only species specific, but even group specific. And it's creative. Those of you who've had mockingbirds in your backyard know that they love to create a new song. And in fact, one of my favorite things to do in our backyard when we start hearing a mockingbird is to do, try to get them to sing with me. So I'll start whistling at the mockingbird, and they'll stop and listen, and then you whistle at them again. After a while, sometimes you can get that mockingbird to start singing back to you. It's wonderful to think that this animal is creating something that is not very different from what we classify as music. And there's every reason to believe that there's even an aesthetic in that animal, that they, they're not doing something that's genetically wired, it's new, it's creative, and they do something that matches an expectation on their part of what's right or what's appropriate. So there's, there's a kind of an aesthetic going on there. This is why neuroscientists are so interested now in studying art and, other, and music and all those uh, sorts of activities uh, beyond the things that originally were the business of the field when it first started. At first, we were preoccupied by how people walk, how animals walk, and how they see, and so on. But now we want to know more and more how they think. And it's not just humans that do that. Uh, Paula will tell you her cats are very brilliant, and they think a lot about it. <laughs> yes, you had another question. Oh, well, it was more of an observation. I was reading something in uh, oh, somewhere a couple weeks ago, and there was a subgenre of entomology that was in study of entomology of insects and politicians. <laughs> but, uh, but it failed because the insects refused to involve themselves with politicians. So I guess it went nowhere. Right? It's people who specialize in cockroaches that study that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, uh, how do you follow a cockroach? Yeah, right. yeah. I, mean, I don't know about that. Well, I'm going to move from that to something beautiful. Uh, one of the things that John and I have talked uh, a lot about is that one's response to music is frequently based, as he was just mentioning, on what we find beautiful as individuals. And it's interesting, however, as I've been playing for people for, for half a century, uh, the things you start noticing about what people want to hear. You know, as there are certain rules of physics, there are certain rules that you find within the area of music. And uh, a lot of these rules are there because the moment you violate them, you make people sit up and listen. Or go, ew, or something like that. Now, now, just just for those of you who aren't musicians, just to introduce you to a few of these rules uh, that have to do with enjoyment and anticipation and expectation, uh, which is all part of the, the condition, and it's not just the human condition, as John was saying. We have, um, within music, a number of uh, parameters. Um, a lot of people 
if they heard me play that, would think, oh, she made a mistake. Within the context of Western music, a lot of you will find this sour. But if it goes this way, you will heave a sigh of relief. <laughs> and so it's sort of, it's sort of like, uh, you know, if you want to call it, I won't call it Newton's Law or anything like that, but you will find this business of magnetism of certain intervals. You will find... harmonically too in chords you know how many do you listen to jazz okay and and you know if you start listening to it carefully you can you you notice there are different kinds of jazz and some is more shall we say uses fewer chords than others some some people go really outside now within the Western system of uh, tonality within a key there's certain uh, chords that seem to sort of follow. We've heard, all heard the grand amen, okay? And we have all heard. And so these are very basic chords, and we're very happy to hear them. And that's part of the reason why so many professional music, music people are bored by a lot of the popular music of today, because the chords are very limited. You'll hear three of them. Maybe four. Actually, in I've actually added a lot of different chords, and these are within the language. But what if I do something really, really way out? <clears throat> Your favorite tune? They're done. Okay, I am giving you a whole set of chords that were, for the most part, unexpected, unless you listen to an awful lot of jazz, okay? And so this, this whole business of, of expectation of what is beautiful, I have ways of pushing your buttons. <laughs> and it is fun. Uh, you know, another button. Push another button? Okay, well, I'm going to use somebody else's buttons, okay? Uh, when, when a master does this, when a master does this. Um, and once again, we're dealing not only with expectation of harmony, but we're dealing with an expectation of contour. Now, what is this? You know, uh, you were talking about Bernstein and his... Uh, his discussion of the rhetorical aspect of this music. is in one of our conversations. Yeah, we were we were we were talking about his rhetor his, the the idea of hooking up the contours of music with that of speech, and therefore once again we have certain expectations. Do you want do you want to tell them yeah. a little bit more about that? Yeah, thank you. There are a couple of things that you triggered. Let me just start with the first one you triggered, which is. The, the, at least in, in the minds of many of us, there are certain relationships in, of sound that are, seem right, and they seem innately right, instinctively right. One great example is a major third. Why don't you show them a big third? You know, play it the other way. The other way. The other direction. Oh, yeah. It's, it's been studied, that, <laughs> shown in studies, that all over the world, in all cultures, Little kids call yeah. each other by saying Johnny or Abdul or, or <laughs> Tom Ball. You know, that major third is almost certainly wired into the human brain. Mm -hmm. And people who know nothing about music, who can't sing, who've never perhaps even heard what we would call music, when they call each other, they use that major third. Yes? Yeah. 
I'd like to gently challenge you. Sure. <laughs> so the example you just gave was the suspension of, of uh, your anticipation of resolution by presenting a minor third and possibly the answer being a major third. Johnny, that's a minor third. Then we're going to a major third. What do you want? <laughs> okay, good point. Okay, I should have said minor third though. Okay. But, big, but, big difference. But, it's, but I know, of course, I understand. But, but, but that interval is what has been shown to be used by kids yeah. innately all over the world. You're right. Yeah, I think kids coo. I mean, my, my great mentor, James Anthony, said that when he first he had his first child, he took great delight in hearing thirds. <laughs> I mean, and the third is a pretty powerful in, in, uh, you know, interval. Uh, once again, you know, we, he was talking about the difference between a major and minor third. We have this. And then we have this. I mean, uh, you know, within the, uh, the context of Western music and kids who don't know very much about it and they hear that and they hear that, they know something is different. And you know, the classic thing is happy and sad, but you know, as I say in the schools, there's no wrong answer, okay? <laughs> However, what if I do this? So I've got two minor thirds on each other, okay? And so there's a completely different feeling between this, this, and this. If I add another third on top of it, then I get... <laughs> or if I take uh, our major third friend, and I add another one on it, and I get... different, I call it a color. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, I hear things differently. You can call it what you want. But uh, in the hands of a skilled composer, again, uh, we can elicit certain reactions from you. Uh, someone said, okay, push some more buttons. Mm -hmm. here's, here's a button. Uh, Schumann. you may recognize this. And I'm outlining something that you find very, very comfortable. A major triad, a major arpeggio. And, and I will probably stay very nicely, well he stays very nicely within a certain key. But listen to see what he is, listen to hear what he does with harmony. And what you feel. Huh? <laughs> Surprise. Okay, two things happened. First of all, the contour changed. There's an expectation deep inside you, and you didn't know about it. I mean, you know, if you know this piece, you know what's about to come. But that's a very, very comfortable idea. But if I go, surprise, that's different. And what the other thing is a different chord. So did you feel, notice something different? That is your reaction. You don't have to put an, uh, an emotion to it.
But this is probably the easiest way, using a parallel contour, but altering it by going and using different harmonies underneath. This is how I play with your mind. <laughs> yeah. Did you did you notice anything? Did you feel anything? Mm -hmm. Is anyone brave enough to tell me what you felt or what you saw? Sometimes it doesn't translate into a word. It doesn't translate into an image. There are some people on this face of the earth in which it absolutely translates into a color. I met, I've known one of them, and I met another one the, the other day, and, and who just absolutely has certain notes are purple, lime green, whatever. <laughs> Sibelius, the great composer Sibelius. That's green. This is orange. And when you go to his house in, uh, in Finland, you will notice my goodness, what an array of odd colors. What decorator did he use? But he used his ear rather than his eye. So, so this is one thing that sort of, uh, again, goes with this business of pleasure, expression, anticipation, expectation, and manipulation, if you will, that is so much a part of what music is as far as the way I communicate with you. And I, of course, take great pleasure when you feel something. I don't care what it is, what you feel, but to me, if you're not bored, that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> so, yes? As a, as a mathematician and a musician. Not a mathematician anymore. Yeah. I, I got stuck in Flatland. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me ask you that, let me pose that question to mm -hmm. you then. When you see the sheet of music in front of you, yeah. Do you see, I mean, I obviously you see the musical notes and the bars and this, but do you also, what, what, what level of mathematics do you experience? Do you experience a calculus level? I mean, what, what level? <laughs> <laughs> you interpret it I, I tell you, okay, just let, let me give you a, a demonstration. I do analyze. I, I automatically analyze. And it's not because I have an analytical mind or anything like that. <laughs> but I analyze in the hopes that I can actually make something happen to my audience. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in this respect, you will find uh, the big parallel, shall we say, between us and doctors. You know, there is an, an element of, of diagnosis about what I do, and in which I read between the lines. You know, I talked about that. Resolving to, oh, does that feel better? Okay. And, and so when I look at something, I, I will look for things that will elicit a reaction in, first of all, in me. And so um, a, a, about two years ago, I did, uh, which is sort of odd, I, I did uh, uh, the, shall we say, the material for a soundtrack for a film that I don't know ever came to be. I don't know why they did the music first. He's still working on it. Uh, I don't know, he's still working. I, don't, I think he's discovering crowdfunding or something like that. <laughs> but in any case, uh, it was all French Baroque music, and we were dealing essentially with a time between the mid-1600s to the mid-1700s, and in particular the, the works of Couperin. And you think about these people as being sort of, you know, um, uh, uh, teacups and wigs and all that sort of stuff, and, and all very uh, civilized. But uh, when I started to look at the stuff, I said, hey, what is this? This is incredibly, incredibly expressive music. And so using this principle of dissonance resolving to consonance, um, I, 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 this is one of my favorite pieces, and it just is called Prelude, and it was written by Couperin. But now, just see if you can hear what I love about it.
Uh, isn't that emotional? This this man once upon a time wearing a suit, wearing a wig, and all that sort of stuff. But what he is doing is he is exploiting that rule that that dissonance must resolve. And so. must resolve mm -hmm. into something else. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I'm playing with you. I'm, I'm hoping that you, like I, will find it an emotional experience. You know, you will find a lot of composers, most composers, dealing with this idea of dissonance resolving into consonants. You'll find this in Mozart, you'll find this all... One of the reasons why everyone sobs during adagio for strings... <laughs> yeah, here you are again. Take it home and listen for those dissonances. And it is, it is quite a visceral reaction to something that I can just sort of say, yeah, okay, I can, I can push people's buttons this way. And generally we don't think this way, but it's there on that, for that night when you would rather be home petting your cat. <laughs> I, saw, I saw a hand back there. Yes. I'm wondering about the sacred, um, in you know, when you're talking about these boundaries and these rules, if there are certain chords um, or areas where you can kind of see where people are making sacred music and where they mine for sacred music. Well, the biggie, of course, is that one, which doesn't sound so bad to us at all, uh, because it's Maria. I just met a girl. And it, this was the devil's interval. And so you find... The beginning of this Dante Sonata is totally built on that interval. Because, you know, technically speaking, as far as wonderful writing, it's not wonderful writing if you leave that hanging by itself. And interest, more interesting enough, of course we're talking to a trombonist, there are certain instruments that are associated with uh, the unholy <laughs> the trombonist. <laughs> it's, it's interesting that what we're talking about though, so far is all about Western music and the tradition yeah. of mm -hmm. traditional harmony. Mm -hmm. And that's only some of music. Now, there's a lot of music in the world. In fact, probably a majority of the people in the world are familiar with and love music that doesn't obey these rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that's an interesting issue, too. Um, but before I hand the baton back, let me say that for those of you who find these issues interesting, that is what, what is sort of innate in our expectation and anticipation, even if you've never heard one of those pieces before, there are moments when you anticipate what's going to happen next. And I think that's innate, at least in us, in, in our part of the world, uh, or it's at least learned very early. Um, if you find that interesting, I want to commend something to you. Forty years ago, Leonard Bernstein was the Charles Eliot Norton lecturer in poetry at Harvard University. Yeah. I was on the faculty there at the time and had the very good fortune to get to know him during that period. Uh, but those lectures, which were truly amazing, he called it the unanswered question, that series of lectures, were all about what I think we're sort of talking about here, which is the embeddedness of music as we know it in our brains. He, he was very influenced at that time by Noam Chomsky, the great linguist, who at that time was developing his very important seminal theory of what's called embedded grammar, that that our brains are wired by the time we emerge from the womb to generate and appreciate and understand language. The, gr the grammatical rules and the handling of verbs and nouns and modifiers, and somehow a lot of that is wired into the brain. 
Uh, and Bernstein was very taken by that. By the way, Bernstein, as great a musician as he was, he was an amazing intellect. And, and I'm coming to the recommendation here in a moment. But in those lectures, he, he made a parallel between music and poetry, talking about embedded musical grammar in the brain and how the architecture of musical uh, creations parallels, if you look at it the right way, the architecture of linguistic creations. Uh, it's a fantastic performance, and you can see it, because the, there are DVDs and VHS versions of those lectures available. You can come home tonight and order it on Amazon. I've, I was there in the audience for his lectures, and I've listened to them, watched them multiple times since then, and I'm always absolutely spellbound by the intellect and articulateness of that man who was, to most of us, the composer of West Side Story and the conductor of the New York Philharmonic. That's just his day job. He was an amazing, he was an amazing intellect, and you will see what I mean if you listen to those lectures. They, they are extraordinary. The question always arises is that if you just merely follow the rules of what seems nice and acceptable to the listener, in other words, we stay within all the right chords, follow all the rules, what do you end up with? And, um, you know, most of what we listen to nowadays is the stuff that has survived the test of time. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent a fair amount of my life investigating the music of a fellow called Jan Ladislav Dusek. And there is some interesting stuff there. Uh, but he was essentially following the norms of his time, and I realized that why he is forgotten. And there's a lot of people who are forgotten that way. So that's, that's sort of a question, you know. Do you have to do you have to stand people's uh, 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 you know uh, turn turn their worlds upside down to be considered great? And there are there are there are little ways of doing it. You can find Schubert, who follows for most of the uh, for me, uh, much of his life uh, or his uh, follows a certain set of rules and then goes out momentarily, because as in the case of Bear, Bear Down, you know all the chords were weird. And it's sort of like too much chocolate. And, and within the context of all those altered chords, uh, in, I can make no impression other than the big impression that, hey, this is bared down weird. So this, so this, this other thing that, that we're dealing with, we, we deal with as performing musicians, and, and as scientists too, I would think, is that of context. Historical context, uh, in, in many cases, just, just the sort of how things are put together. And one of the things that I have fun doing is, and I'm just going to demonstrate what uh, another pianist has done, is taking things out of context and making you, we'll see what you do. <laughs>
different dress and different guises. So I made you laugh. And so the fact that I've taken something that belongs somewhere in your experience, in your usual context, and I put it into another one, has elicited a reaction. And from the first bar, I heard a laugh from here. <laughs> so, so once again, uh, I've, I've sort of had a good time um, playing with you. <laughs> you. You frequently talked about the pieces that really get to you. That, that's another take on anticipation. We, we, I think we just agreed, or at least we talked about the notion that even if you haven't heard a piece before, if it follows the traditions of Western harmony, you feel anticipation of what's going to come next. And because suspensions resolve and so forth, we expect that. Of course, in the 20th century, things started to change. Yeah, and, and in Bernstein's lectures, he talks about that. What was the what happened when atonal music came in? Well, I don't want to give away what he had to say. I hope you'll all listen to his lecture. But there's another take on anticipation, which is what Paul is prompting me to say. Because for me, it's extremely important. I think it may be for others, too. And that is, when you know music, when you know a piece of music well, a big part of the pleasure of hearing it again is the anticipation of what you know is coming. And there are some passages in, in music that for me are just magical, that I will never tire of hearing them, no matter how many times I hear them. Uh, I, I think of the music of Richard Wagner. Now, most people will agree that he was not a very nice man, but he was a <laughs> phenomenal composer, a genius by any definition. And there's one passage in the second movement, in the second act of, of Lohengrin, the longest piece ever written in one meter. It's a 4-4 that goes on for hours. <laughs> Some people think too many are. I think it's a glorious piece of music. But that little riff in the middle of the second movement comes in a very emotional, second act, comes at a very emotional time. Uh, and it's played by just the strings, playing beautiful, incredibly lovely harmony of a little theme of the innocence of Elsa, if you know the opera. I wish Wagner had written several hours of that music because it's so glorious, but it's not the kind of music that we associate with him. And yet I think about it from the first note of that opera, waiting for that moment to come. And I think, you know, for, I remember the time I heard it for the first time, and I thought it was fabulous. I didn't anticipate it then. But now the role of memory and anticipation for me is a big part of the enjoyment, the appreciation of the music. And Gail's nodding here because we have many moments that we feel that way about in music. It's uh, Another piece. Yeah. But I, I can say it's true for many pieces. And one other thing I want to say is sort of on the same thing. You know, you, you did Cooper. One of the things that I think makes Bach such a genius mm -hmm. is that Bach knew how the brain works, I'm sure. There are moments in Bach where he gets right to the core of what you're, where you feel things. Take the example in, I think it's in the Matthew Passion, when he talks about Jesus crying in Vinita. The music for that, I can't remember, I can't sing it, but the music couldn't be more perfect to represent that. You don't have to know German. All you have to do is listen to the music and you know what's happening. The drama unfolds in the music because the music talks right to your brain bypassing language and everything else. That's another big point that, that Leonard Bernstein made. He talks about music as poetry, but, but it's special poetry that has the privilege of getting right into your brain without the complication of words. You don't have to know words. You don't have to know anything. The music speaks right to you with, with all the feelings that, that the composer intends to convey to you, if it's a good composer. That's another thing about Wagner. Wagner tells the whole story in all of his music dramas in the music. The singers are kind of incidental. Uh, I mean, this is not my invention. This is something that people have written about. You can tell everything that's going to happen and does happen and has happened by the music. I think that's a phenomenal use of music to convey a story. But music doesn't have to do that. It can convey feelings. It can, can, can convey experience that isn't articulatable in language. And I think that's probably the most important thing that one can say about songs without words, if you will, 
Um, you know, much of today's popular music, oh well, you know, the, the last century too, has had words to it, and, and I enjoy it very much. But when you listen to pure music, music without words, music without a program, it invites you to be creative yourself, uh, in that if you ever want to tell a person why you like that piece of music, uh, you ha yourself have to paint a picture in words. And one of the reasons I am uh, pretty impassioned about the idea of music as being part of the experience of everyone is that it is a form of creativity that can be experienced and shared in by anyone of any age, mm -hmm. of any background. Mm -hmm. And this whole business about being creative, some people have heard me say this before, in a, a time when all our senses are sort of inundated, you know, everything is, is there in front of you. And the, the, the opportunity to go into a piece of music and let it speak to you in your own way is very special indeed. I'm getting a high sign, so we're going to continue this discussion at the tables. But I want to say thank you very much to the. Yes, we have a question. If, if I may, and hopefully it's maybe it's just me, which things often are, and it's like, but talking about an assault, assault on one's senses. Uh, I've heard you any number of times, and it's always wonderful to hear your speaking and your music, and your very inspiring. Uh, you know, repartee, you know, on this on this subject here. But I'm I'm getting an overlay and it's never happened and I've dealt with a lot of music in my life. There's this waft of garlicky sauce <laughs> infusing <laughs> in, infusing this room which which is creating like this delectability parfait. Uh, and, and, and it, it's it's just an, an, an So let extra, me play you out. Yes. Okay. We, we ought to pipe in garlicky sauces when whenever whenever there's music playing. And uh, by the way, it's just a little or something. In neuroscience we call that the merging of the senses. The merging of the senses. <laughs> Thank you.